Hello, I've got some more revision notes for you for the MRCOG part two exam. I think um, what I'm about to share with you is absolutely essential and you have to know these very well um, for your part two. Um, so I hope you will um, stay focused and listen to the presentation very carefully. So um, biothermal effects. So this table is talking about the temperature and the effect on the tissue of the temperature. So 37 degrees Celsius, um, the tissue effect is normal temperature. 45 to 50 degrees Celsius, tissue effect is hyperthermia along with reduced enzyme activity and necrosis. 60 to 80 degrees Celsius, denaturation of proteins and collagen, coagulation and desiccation, 100 degrees, vaporization and ablation, more than 100 degrees, carbonization, more than 300 degrees Celsius, melting. Very important, uh, I think we've had questions from this table to say what temperature and what happens to the tissue at that temperature. Right, so this table uh, talks about the different heart failure drugs, which include the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, you've got your mineral mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, diuretics and vasodilators. So beta blockers are safe during pregnancy, safe during lactation. Um, ACE inhibitors avoid teratogenic due to risk of fetal kidney injury, uh, low transfer of enalapril and captopril uh, during lactation, hence relatively safe. Angiotensin receptor blockers are to be avoided and they are teratogenic during pregnancy. Limited data for lactation so best to avoid. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, uh, no data so best avoided during pregnancy. Limited data so best avoided during lactation. Diuretics use sparingly as they can cause uh, decreased uh, placental blood flow. Thiazides and furosemide are most commonly used. Thiazides are uh, that's during pregnancy. Thiazides are best um, uh, studied uh, drug during lactation and are well tolerated. Uh, vasodilators includes nitrates and hydralazine used with caution during pregnancy may precipitate uterine um, hypoperfusion and it's safe during lactation. So patients with high thrombotic risk who should be considered for bridging with treatment dose heparin when they stop warfarin. So venous thromboembolism, so embolism, so VTE within the previous three months, very high risk patients for VTE who have a target um, INR of 3.5. AF patients, so patients who've had a stroke or transient ischemic attack in the last three months, patients who've had a previous stroke or TIA and have had three or more of the following risk factors, so conge congestive cardiac failure, hypertension, age above 35, diabetes mellitus. Mechanical heart wells, patients with mechanical heart valve other than those with a bileaflet aortic valve and no other um, risk factors. Medical procedures and their associated bleeding risk. No bleeding risk with pelvic examinations, smear tests, genital swabs, minor bleeding risk with cervical biopsy, diagnostic hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy and resection of polyp, labia and Bartholin's abscess, large lube excision of transformation zone, myosure polypectomy, novosure ablation, pipel biopsy, transcervical resection of endometrium and vulval biopsy. Major bleeding risk um, is uh, all day case and inpatient surgery. Right, so this table talks about the different drugs and, um, and basically when should they be stopped and restarted for surgery. So aspirin, uh, does not need to be stopped, it can be carried on. Clopidogrel, uh, Prasugrel and Tecagrelor um, needs to be
be assessed based on the bleeding risk. So if there's a low bleeding risk in patients with recent coronary syndrome or coronary artery stent on dual antiplatelet therapy, it's important to assess the need of performing the procedure. Uh, consulta consultation with the hematologist should be considered before proceeding. High bleeding risk, um, then any of the surgery cannot be postponed, then if not possible, stop medication seven days before um, and continue with um, aspirin following liaison with hematology. When should it be restarted? Restart when hemostasis is achieved, so usually 12 to 24 hours post-surgery. Right, so we've got some more drugs now, warfarin, apixaban, rivaroxaban, adoxaban and uh, dabigatrin. So warfarin, uh, half-life is approximately 36 hours. Uh, when should it be stopped? So low bleeding risk, five days prior to elective surgery with INR check daily um, before surgery. Um, high bleeding risk, five days before surgery as well with INR check um, daily as well. When should it be restarted? So low blood bleeding risk, then start warfarin when adequate hemostasis is achieved, approximately 12 to 24 hours after surgery. A low molecular weight heparin can be restarted 24 hours after surgery um, until INR is in range. High bleeding risk, low molecular weight uh, heparin should not be given until 48 hours after surgery. Restart warfarin when bleeding risk is minimized. Low molecular weight heparin should be continued until INR is in therapeutic range. Mechanical thromboprophylaxis should be considered in all cases until INR is in therapeutic range. So apixaban and rivaroxaban. Um, so for low bleeding risk, um, if the creatinine clearance is greater than 30, stop 24 hours prior to surgery. If creatinine clearance is less than 30, then stop 48 hours prior to surgery. Um, for restarting and low bleeding risk, recommend 6 to 12 hours post-procedure. In high bleeding risk, creatinine clearance of greater than 30, stop 48 hours prior to surgery. Um, in, if creatinine clearance is less than 30, stop 72 hours prior to surgery. In high bleeding risk, wait 48 hours before reintroducing at the full dose. If high risk VTE, consider prophylactic dose of anticoagulation before restarting at full therapeutic dose. Adoxaban and uh, dabigatrin. Um, so, so for the three drugs, apixaban, rivaroxaban and adoxaban, it's the same, it's the same thing that we have discussed. For dabigatrin, um, if it's low bleeding risk, creatinine clearance greater than um, 80, then stop tw uh, 24 hours prior to surgery. If creatinine clearance is greater than 50 and less than 80, stop 48 hours prior. If creatinine clearance is greater than or equal to 30, less than 50, stop 72 hours prior. The low bleeding risk for, uh, for you to restart, recommend 6 to 12 hours post-procedure. In high bleeding risk, if creatinine clearance is above 80, stop 48 hours prior. If creatinine clearance is above 50, less than 80, stop 72 hours prior. If creatinine clearance is uh, greater than 30 or less than 50, stop 9 to 6 hours prior. For high bleeding risk, wait 48 hours before reintroducing at the full dose. If high VTE risk, consider prophylactic dose of anticoagulation before starting at full therapeutic dose. A very, very, very important table for your um, upcoming exams. Right, we now move on to another important table. Now, this is a summary of different treatment options for vaginal estrogen deficiency. So you've got moisturizers and lubricants. You have vaginal estrogen. Um, you have systemic HRT, transdermal or oral. You have um, phytoestrogens. Uh, vaginal and oral. You've got laser treatment, vaginal. You've got selective estrogen receptor modulators, orally. Tissue selective estrogen complex, complex um, treatment, orally. Androgens and um, and DHEA, which is oral and vaginal as well, which is dehydroepiandosterone. So um, this table talks about advantages of these and cautions. So for example, for moisturizers, they can elevate symptoms of mild to moderate vulvovaginous atrophy, um, can elevate, uh, um, alleviate dyspareunia caused by vulvovaginal atrophy, can be used in women who have contraindications to estrogen. Lubricants can only provide short-term relief during intercourse, not effective in cases of severe um, atrophy, need to be pH and osmolality balanced, otherwise irritation and discharge can occur. 
Vaginal estrogens improve symptoms uh, without the need for progesterone opposing treatment, reverses physiological changes of menopause, minimal systemic absorption. Um, cautions should be used with caution in women who have contraindications to estrogen. Benefits only last for as long as treatment is continued. Systemic HRT can alleviate symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy as well as vasomotor symptoms and osteoporosis. Uh, caution is best used in the presence of vasomotor symptoms or osteoporosis, not recommended in women who have contraindications to estrogen. Uh, phytoestrogens. Um, some vaginal, not oral preparations have shown similar effects as vaginal estrogen should be used with caution in women who have contraindications to estrogen. Laser treatment, uh, preliminary uh, prospective observed data are, sh are showing benefit, can be used in women who have contraindications to estrogen. Um, more long-term um, laser um, need uh, to prove efficacy. Um, selective uh, estrogen receptor modulator, so um, the, 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 the advantages, so you have got um, os, um, ospimephine and lasofoxifene are the most effective, are effective in treatment of vaginal, uh, vag uh, vulvovaginal atrophy as, as well as osteoporosis, um, can be used in women who have contraindications to estrogen. Most, more studies are needed to assess safety for the endometrium and with uh, lasofoxifene. Tissue selective estrogen complex treatment can elevate symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy, hot flushes and bone, lo bone loss, has potential protective effects for breast and endometrium. A relatively new treatment, long-term long data um, regarding safety would be desirable. No product range, only one dose, which may not be um, sufficiently estrogenic for some women. Um, androgens and dehydroepiandosterone. Uh, so vaginal administration, administration appears safe and effective in treatment of vulvovaginal atrophy, can improve libido, minimal systemic absorption, relatively new treatment, more safety data regarding systemic effects would be desirable. Okay, next we move on to the features of Turner syndrome. So you've got hearing loss, facial features like ptosis, hyper, um, hypertelorism, um, and you've got retroganthia and microganthia, cardiovascular malformations like coactation of the aorta, bicuspid aortic valve, conduction abnormalities, gentle urinary symptoms, so premature ovarian sufficiency, renal anomalies, you've got lymphedema, you've got cubitus valgus, widely spaced nipples, hypothyroidism, webbed neck and short stature. Okay, so this table talks about fertility um, preservation options for women with, tran with Turner syndrome. Um, again, something that can easily come up as an EMQ, as options to dis discuss with potential couple, for example. So aspects of fertility preservation covered by each technique. So you've got reproductive uh, autonomy, oocyte freezing, yes, embryo freezing, no. Embryos may have to be discarded if relationship status changes. Ovarian tissue freezing, yes. Perinatal outcome and short-term health of children in women um, with, without, with or without Turner syndrome. So oocyte freezing is, is limited data. Embryo freezing, um, good data for women without Turner syndrome. Ovarian tissue, there is very limited data. Need for assisted reproductive techniques like IVF and ICSI. Oocyte freezing, yes. Embryo freezing, yes. Ovarian tissue freezing, optional. Natural conception is possible after re-transplantation of frozen ovarian tissue. Use of surrogacy if pregnancy is contraindicated. Oocyte freezing, yes. Embryo freezing, yes. Ovarian tissue freezing may not be possible. Um, applicability, so uh, uh, oocyte freezing is uh, post-pubertal. Uh, um, embryo freezing is post-pubertal as well. Ovarian tissue is also pre-pubertal and post-pubertal. Right. Um, thank you so much for listening and uh, and staying tuned uh, for this important uh, set of um, tables as well. I will carry on doing more revision slides uh, so for your upcoming exams. So um, I hope you are really benefiting from these as I'm trying to highlight all the important points uh, from your TOG articles um, that could potentially come up uh, in your um, upcoming exams. Good luck revising.